G'day traders, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I've got something really cool for you guys. Now this script took me way, way longer than it should have to complete. I've been working on this for a few weeks now. And what you see on my chart is a monthly profit and loss breakdown based on realized equity. So we're talking closed trade basis only. And the table is showing our intra month P&L and our max drawdown for the year. So I'll just quickly break this down. We've got our year on the left here. We have our months up here. We have the total return for the year and the max drawdown for that year. And then a green cell means we turned a profit for this month. A red cell means we took a loss for that month. And then the table is adding up the total return for each year and each year's corresponding max drawdown. Now the code to the script as being made as modular as possible, meaning that you can copy and paste the code I've written into your own strategy scripts and it will work straight out of the box. You don't need to touch anything. It'll just display on your chart as you see here. Now I'm on SPY, so the S&P 500 ETF, uh, which has data going back to the 90s. So we have quite a large table here. Now the script I'm using for today's example, this strategy is the simple pullback strategy from a few months ago, I recorded a video uh, where I took someone else's strategy rules and built out a, a PineScript system based on those rules. It's completely open source, uh, but for today's lesson, I'm not going to explain the rules of this system because I've already done that in its own video. Uh, but just so you guys know, that's what I'm working with today. A link to that lesson and the source code to that uh, script will be below in the video description and the pinned comment. So with all that out of the way, this is gonna be probably a slightly longer lesson than average because I need to break down all of this source code. Now, you don't need to understand what this code is doing. You can copy from line, from this line down and paste all of this into your own system and it will work straight away. But for today's video, I do wanna take the time to explain to you guys what I did here so that you can learn from the hours and hours I put into this script. So without further ado, let me enlarge my screen and get started breaking down the code. All right, so first of all, I need to get a disclaimer out of the way. If you're going to use any of this code to inform your own trading process or backtesting process, you do so completely at your own risk. While I've done my absolute best to ensure this code is as accurate as possible, it's possible that I've missed something. In my testing, everything seems to be working fine, but there's always a chance I've missed something, especially with complex systems. So always do your own due diligence. Don't just take my word for everything or anyone else's word for anything. Always do your own testing and confirmation that things are behaving as advertised. Now, first of all, why did I make the script in the first place when we have all this information here? Well, first of all, the strategy tester does not give you a month or yearly breakdown of your PL. It only gives you a running PL uh, breakdown or performance summary at the very end of your back test. Now you can export this information into Excel and with a bunch of complex formulas, you can get pretty much the same thing I've done here, but I wanted something that I could just throw on to the charts and look at at a glance really easily without screwing around with Excel and all of that. The other problem with the performance, uh, the strategy testers performance metrics is that this is based on open running PL, not on a closed trade basis. So your max drawdown, for example, let's say you had a script that never had a losing trade, but your profit dipped at times and came close to your stop loss. Let's say that this is my stop loss each line. This number here will factor in these declines, even though you didn't close a trade for a loss because it's calculated based on a running P and L basis. Now that's useful for uh, useful information to know. But for me, when I'm testing a system, I only really care about how much it lost on a realized basis, on a closed trade basis. And so that's what this table does. It breaks down your PL on a monthly basis and a yearly basis, and it's based on closed trade equity, not open trade equity, open PL. Now, with that said, let's get into the source code. Here is the source code to the simple pullback strategy that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm not going to go into this. It's a very simple script. It's just simply buying pullbacks on the SPY ETF. And it does so when price closes between two short-term MAs. So it's a long only system just to keep things simple. So if we scroll down, this is where the monthly table code is, or as my grandmother would say, this is where it lives. Now, if you copy all of this code into your own systems and paste it at the bottom of your strategy code, 
you should be getting a table just like this without having to modify anything. So if you're not interested in how this code works, that's fine. You can just go and get the source code and paste it into your script. But if you are interested, let's get started breaking it down. So before we continue, it's important that I mention the source code to this script is based on a different script created by Quant Nomad. And here is a link to their original script code. I have severely or sig severely, I've significantly adapted this source code or changed this source code added to it. Um, so my script barely resembles the original script, but I need to give credit where credit is due. And Quant Nomad laid out the core um, template for this script, particularly the table code. Uh, so go and check this script out if you're curious to see the difference between mine and this one. So first of all, as always, I have a bunch of user inputs. So the user inputs we're working with today in this script are under this t label here. So I've grouped them all into um, rows, so everything's a bit tidier. We have the on off switch, which does exactly what you think it does. We have the debug mode. Now debug mode, um, I think I'll leave this in when I publish the source code, just because it's there, I might as well. It's off by default. But if you turn this on, now we get, um, let me turn the table off because I've made my screen massive and it's taking up my whole chart now. Um, these debug labels are showing the profit and, uh, profit and loss as a percentage on a closed trade basis. So if I scroll in here, Let's look at uh, the month of April. So here's the first trading day of April. So here's the first trading day of May. So the system closed a trade in April for a 1.17% gain, which means if I turn on my table, we should see for the month of April, 2023, a 1.17% gain. And if I hover over each cell, there's a tool tip that will tell you the max drawdown for each month and the max favorable excursion for each month. That's what MFE stands for. And that's just the fancy way of saying how much profit did you make in that month versus what you ended up with at the end of the month. So if you had a bunch of winners at the start of the month and then a few losers, the MFE will be higher than the actual monthly return. And uh, this is just a useful net metric to give you an idea of um, how much profit your system is potentially leaving on the table. But anyway, this debug label is just to allow you to confirm that the information you're seeing on the table is accurate. And if you hover over the label, there's a tool tip that gives you a bunch of information on a month by month and year by year and total basis. So that's what the debug mode does. Then we have decimal precision. This is um, the precision of the table. So if I set that to three, we, we now have three decimal places after the full stop, but that is set to two by default because I find that having more than two makes it a bit more difficult to analyze the information here. Um, the script does round these numbers, so they are going to be slightly inaccurate. And that's why I included an option to increase the decimal precision if you need to dive a little deeper into certain numbers. And then all of these here are just formatting colors. So here's the year profit color. I could change that to aqua if I want to. And that's going to change the color scheme of the table. Let's set all of this back to the default settings, turn debug off and get back to our code. So that's the user inputs. After we get our script inputs, I then define a custom function and a few custom types, data types. So this custom function is for getting decimal precision based on a given number. I just said that you can change the decimal precision of the chart itself to three or more decimal places. But you'll notice that some of these cells actually override that setting and have three decimal places, even though I've set it to two. The reason for this is so that any number that falls between greater than zero and less than 0 0.5 or less than zero and greater than negative 0 0.05, then we set the decimal precision to three. That's because if we don't do that, the script will round some of these numbers down to zero. And so you'll see on this, for example, this is the cell that I first noticed doing this um, because it's 0 0.004, this was rounding down to zero. And so I had a green cell with a zero in it and it didn't really make any sense um, to the eye, just looking at the chart, the table. So I made an override that if the number is very, very small, it is automatically set to three decimal places. That way you can actually see what happened in this month. So this month was basically a break even month, but the table would show a zero in a green cell if I didn't do this. So that's what this functions for. If the number falls outside this range, it just returns whatever setting you've put in here. Next up, we have our custom data types. Now these 
weren't really necessary. I just did it to keep the script tidy, keep everything organized. So the first type data type here is defining an open trades cost, which is used to calculate commission costs on a trade by trade basis. So we have the entry time of the trade, the entry price and the commission cost. I'll explain how we use this later on. Uh, but next we have the strategies monthly return type. So this stores a running monthly profit drawdown, the peak return for that month and the timestamp of that month. And then we have the exact same data type um, structure, except this is for yearly returns now. So monthly and yearly returns have their own data type, but they all keep the same information. The total profit, the worst drawdown, the peak profit and the timestamp of that uh, month or year. So we use these later on in the script. We'll get to that soon. All right. So next up, we have a whole bunch of data types here. Now they're all pretty self-explanatory. Um, we have our accumulated monthly P&L, our accumul accumulated yearly P&L, our accumulated total P&L. We have our best monthly P&L and our best yearly P&L. These numbers get stored into these data types at the end of each month or the end of each year. And then um, these data types are put into an array, which we'll get to soon. This is storing the accumulated P&L value. So the running tally for the current month and current year. Next up, we have our drawdown values. So there's quite a few variables here. We have our equity peak. This is a total equity peak for the entire back test. We have our current yearly equity high and our current yearly drawdown and our year's max drawdown for the current year. Then we have our worst drawdown for the entire back test period. Then we have our monthly equity high, same as yearly equity high, but for the month, same with current monthly drawdown and monthly max drawdown. So some of these variables are identical to each other, but on a monthly and yearly basis. Next up, we store our long and short trade count. That's just so that we can see, um, where does it say? If I hover over one of these values, here we go. The total return, if I hover my mouse over there, we get a tool tip that pops up telling me my win rate on a long and short trade basis. So different groups. Now this system I have on my chart is a long only pullback system. So it only ever took long trades. And so the win rate for long trades is identical to the overall win rate. But if I had a script that was taking long and short trades, we'd be able to see here how the two different um, directional biases play out in our system. And that is only possible because we track these values here. So we track our total break even trades, total long trades, total one long trades, total short trades and total one short trades. And this is all the variables we need in order to generate this entire table. So let's move on to where we start doing the actual calculations. So first we need to store the open trades commission cost in an array. I'll explain why in a moment, it's a little bit complex. It took me a while to figure out a solution to the problem that this solves, um, but we'll get to that in a moment. So the first thing we do in this script is detect an opened trade and save the cost of that trade. So to detect a newly opened trade, a fresh open trade, we check if the current open trades count on the current bar is not equal to the open trades count on the previous bar and our closed trades is equal, our current closed trades count is equal to the closed trades count on the previous bar because open trades will not match the previous bars open trades if a trade is opened or a trade is closed, but we only want to detect opened trades. So we need to make sure that we didn't just close a trade, we actually opened a trade. Once we detect this condition, this code gets executed and this code calculates the cost of the current trade by subtracting the current bars gross loss, uh, sorry, subtracting the previous bars gross loss from the current bars gross loss. Because the trade's just been opened, we haven't actually lost any money yet, but this gross loss will actually factor in the commission cost of the trade. So when we open our trade, gross loss will increase by the commission cost. And so this is how we can detect the cost of the open trade. Then once we have the cost of the open trade, we push a new trade cost type. So that's this type I explained already. We need an entry time and entry price and the cost. So we push this new trade cost type into our array using the push function. And we create a new trade cost type with the entry time. So we get the strategy.opentrades list and we get the entry time of our current open trades count minus one. Now I know this gets, this gets a bit confusing, but basically we're getting the most recent open trades entry time. That's what this line of code is doing. It's saying, get me the entry time of an open trade with the open trade index of the last one in the list, which will be the most recently open trade. 
Um, then we do the same thing for the entry price, exactly the same code, but for the entry price. And then we pass in our cost of trade as well. And that adds the current trades cost to our array so that later on when this trade gets closed, we can factor in the commission cost of that closed trade accurately. Because uh, remember, each position that gets open is going to have a different commission cost based on how many contracts were traded. So this is the best way I could come up with to track the commission cost accurately. There could be a better way. In fact, there probably is a better way, uh, but this was the best solution I could come up with and um, it works. So I'm sticking with it until I can think of a better solution. So now this script only takes one trade at a time, but theoretically this code should work with scripts that pyramid that open multiple positions. That's why I did it this way. I could have made this a lot simpler, um, but I wanted to make it as robust as possible so that it works with all kinds of different systems, not just this system I added to my chart, this simple pullback strategy. So now that we're tracking our commission costs, the next thing we need to do is detect when a trade is closed. This is where the core, the heart of the script is. All of this code under this if statement is where we add up our profit, our loss, our um, all of the data we need in order to populate this table. So to detect a closed trade, it's a lot easier than detecting an open trade. We just need to check if the current bar's closed trade count is not equal to the previous bar's closed trade count. And then what we need to do is track the cumulative profit percent. So if I open the strategy tester and go to list of trades, that's this, see this 0.62%, 0.39%, 1.17%, etc. This is the cumulative profit on a tr closed trade basis. So when the trade is closed, this is how much of a percentage return we made on our account balance. I need to simulate that in this table. And in order to do that, unfortunately, there's no simple way to do this. There's no strategy dot um, cumulative profit list in the um, strategy library. There's no like, closed trades dot cumulative profit. I can't do something like this, unfortunately. I really wish they had this, this function implemented. It would make this script so much easier to code. But unfortunately, we don't have that option. And so I need to replicate this formula myself. So I went into the trading view documentation and this is how they explain, um, this is their explanation for how cumulative profit percent is calculated. It's calculated by dividing the trade profit or loss by your initial capital plus the cumulative profit of all the previous trades that your script has taken multiplied by 100 to turn it into a percentage. So the first thing we need to do in order to execute this mathematical formula is calculate our trade profit. To do that, we also need to factor in the commission cost. So that's why we have all this code up here. And so when a trade is closed, the first thing we need to do is retrieve the trade cost for this closed trade from our commission array. So to do that, I create a new float variable called trade cost, it's set to zero. Now, when this trade is closed and we calculate the trade cost, we also need to remove the um, commission cost from our array because we've already taken it into consideration. We don't need it in the array anymore. So I also keep a remove index variable here to tell the script which array index to remove from our commission cost list after we have retrieved the cost. So to retrieve the cost, we use just a simple for loop here, starting from zero, looping up to the cost of our open trades array size minus one. You always need to subtract one from an array size because it starts counting at zero, but the size, um, so if you've got one array element, size will be one because you've got one array element. But if you go to reference that array element using the get function, you start from zero. So if an array contains any elements, its size is always going to be one index larger than we can actually reference. So we need to subtract one from the array size when we're looping through an array. Um, so that's what we're doing here. Then we're uh, creating a trade cost type data type called TC. And this trade cost TC is equal to our cost of open trades array dot get this current loop index. So we're looping through all of the open trades in our commission cost array list and getting them all one by one and then we're checking if that entry time is equal to the closed trades entry time of the trade we literally just closed. So if this trade we just detected as closed, the last closed trade in our closed trades list or array, if the entry time 
of that closed trade is equal to the entry time of our commission cost uh, when that trade was opened and the entry price of that open trade where we saved the commission cost. If that open trades entry price is equal to this closed trades entry price, then we've found a match for this closed trades commission cost. And so we save the trade cost, we save the remove index, the current loop index, and we break out of the loop and the rest of our code here is executed. So the first thing we do is we check if remove index is not equal to negative one, that means we actually found a relevant trade in our closed trade list and we need to remove the commission cost from our array because we no longer need that information. We've already got the trade cost so that we can calculate our cumulative profit percent. So the next thing we need to do is calculate our equity before the trade was closed. Now. I've got a note here that strategy.equity will not do for this because equity, strategy.equity changes on a bar by bar based on open profit and loss, not realized profit and loss. So what that means is if I compare the P&L of, um, let's look, this trade here, closed here. Actually, that's a bad example because it opened here and closed here. Let me find a trade that was open for a few bars. Here we go. So this trade was opened here and on each bar that prints my strategy dot equity. So this variable here will change on each bar, even though the trade hasn't closed yet. So that will not give what we need here. We need to calculate the equity, the current realized equity before the trade closed. So in other words, our account balance before the trade closed regardless of what open profit we have on that trade. So to do that, I need to add our net profit on the previous bar. Remember net profit will only update when a trade is closed. So we can add the net profit on the bar before our trade closed to our initial capital, the capital we started with, and that will give us our pre-trade equity, our account balance before the trade was closed. Now, once we have this, we can now calculate the profit and loss plus the cost of this trade. Now, this is where things get a little bit confusing, and this is something that took me way too long to figure out. But for whatever reason, gross profit takes into account the commission cost of a trade, but gross loss does not. I can't, I, I don't know why I couldn't figure this out, but the numbers just did not add up until I did this, and I included the trade cost in the gross loss. So that's why I went to all this trouble of tracking the open trades commission cost so that when it comes to calculating the actual P&L for losing trades, we need to add in the trade cost in order to get an accurate number here. So what I'm doing here is I'm checking if our losing trade count is greater than the losing trade count on the previous bar. That means the trade we just closed was a losing trade. And so we need to set profit loss to the current bar's gross loss minus the previous bar's gross loss minus the commission cost of that trade. And then we multiply it by negative one to get a negative number because gross loss is always gonna be a positive number. Um, we need to turn it into a negative number in order to get a negative profit loss number here. And otherwise, if this condition is not met, then that means that we just had a winning trade or a break even trade. And we can simply set profit loss to our gross profit on the current bar minus the previous bar's gross profit. Now we have our profit and loss um, later on, we'll get to it in a moment. We use this number to calculate our cumulative profit percentage, which is this number here. So all, all of this code so far is just to get this friggin' number here. And now you can see why this script took so long and why I get a little bit frustrated when I talk about how long it took. So far, we have all the numbers we need in order to calculate our cumulative, cumulative profit and loss for each trade as it's closed, not on a running open PL basis, but on a closed trade basis. So now that we have an accurate profit and loss value to work with, the next thing I do here is just simply check if this trade was a long or short trade and if it won or lost. So if our position size was positive on the previous bar, that means we had a long trade open because a long trade has a positive contract number and a short trade has a negative contract number. And if it's equal to zero, then we have no trade open. So if the previous bar's position size was greater than zero, then we had a open long trade. So we can add one to our long trade total long trade counter. And if profit loss, our P&L for this trade was positive, then we had a winning trade. So we can add one to our winning trade counter for long trades. Then we do exactly the same thing for short trades, 
but the opposite direction. And we can use this information later to um, analyze our win rate for long trades and short trades. And then here we also check if the trade broke even. So this is going to be very rare with this particular system based on the way it exits trades. But there is a chance that we could have a flat PL on the trade. And if our profit loss is equal to zero, then we increase our total break even trades counter. And then finally, we get to calculate our cumulative profit percent. This number here, finally, ah, the relief. Cumulative profit percent is equal to the profit and loss on this trade as a dollar value divided by the equity of our account balance, the closed trade equity, the non-running P&L of our account on the previous bar before this trade closed. And we multiply that by 100. And this number here is equal to this number here, regardless of position size and commission cost. And now we can finally break all of this information down into a monthly and yearly um, format. Uh, but before we do that, we need to track some other values, um, such as our equity peak. This is for um, calculating our max drawdown and max favorable excursion, etc. So here we store the highest peak value of our equity, our count balance. And we can now use strategy.equity since equity is updated to realize PL on this bar. So I just explained earlier how strategy.equity updates on a bar by bar basis. So if you've got an open trade for several bars, your equity will change based on uh, where price action is in relation to your stop loss and take profit. But since this code in this if statement is executed after a trade is closed, we can now use strategy.equity. So anyway, we store our highest peak value of equity, and then we also calculate the total max drawdown for this system, um, which will be slightly different to this number because as I mentioned, this number takes into account our open PL, whereas my max drawdown, worst drawdown, only factors in losing trades. So it adds up our losing trades cumulative profit, or in this case, cumulative losses. And that gives us our max drawdown, the worst drawdown for this total system backtest. So to calculate the drawdown, we need to subtract the current bar's max equity from our peak equity, the highest equity value we ever reached. And we divide that number by our equity peak and multiply it by 100 to get a percentage. And this will give us our max drawdown as a percentage or the current drawdown as a percentage. And if the current drawdown is worse than or less than our worst drawdown, then we wanna save the current drawdown into our worst drawdown and override whatever the previous baby drawdown was. As Nick Raj likes to say, your worst drawdown is always ahead of you. And so <laughs> this will be updated forever and ever into the future. Um, there will always be a worse drawdown than the previous worst drawdown. And this code will make sure that we track that information. Anyway, moving on, we then store our accumulated monthly and yearly profit and loss into these three values uh, or variables. So our accumulated monthly PL is going to be the cumulative profit percent, this value here, which is um, this number here. We are adding this number onto the accumulative accumulated monthly PL on the previous bar. And then later on, when a new month starts, this gets reset to zero and we store whatever the value this uh, variable was at the end of that month. And this is how we track the accumulated monthly PL to display on the table. Then we do the same thing for our yearly profit and loss, our accumulated yearly PL and our accumulated total PL. And then when a new year starts, we reset this to zero. And when a new month starts, we reset this to zero and save whatever those values were at that end of month or end of year period. Um, now there's a few more if statements here where we just save some various data performance metrics. So here we save the max favorable excursion for this month, which is our peak return as a percentage. So if our accumulated PL is greater than our best accumulated monthly PL, this is the opposite of max drawdown. So max drawdown for the month will track how low our equity got during that month before we ended the month. Um, this tracks how high our equity got before the end of the month. And so this will track our max favorable excursion, which is a fancy way in this context of tracking the opposite of max drawdown. Max adverse excursion would be the opposite. It would be how close did price get to our stop loss without actually touching it? Because if it touched it, then that becomes a drawdown metric. If it didn't touch it, that's the max adverse excursion. 
Now, I don't track the max adverse excursion in this script because I don't think it's really necessary. We probably don't even need to track them. Uh, max favorable excursion, to be honest, but I did it because I was curious and it wasn't very difficult to add it to the script. And it just makes it a little bit more, uh, you know, there's just a little bit more information to work with. So why not? So anyway, we track the MFE for this month and the MFE for this year. Then we track the max equity high for our total drawdown calculation, the worst drawdown the system has encountered. Then we track the max equity high for the current year so that we can track the max yearly drawdown for this current year. So this is the total worst drawdown. This is the current year's worst drawdown. And then the next thing we do is check if our yearly realized equity high minus the current realized equity exceeds our max drawdown for the year. In other words, this statement here checks if we have just lost some money. And if so, then we update our current yearly drawdown. And if our current yearly drawdown is worse than our max drawdown for this year, then we save that to our yearly max drawdown. And then when a new year begins, we store our max drawdown for the year, our profit for the year, our max favorable excursion for the year, etc., into a data type that gets displayed in our table later. Now I have some unfinished comments here. This, uh, this tracks the max equity high over current month for max monthly drawdown calculation. And I can pretty much copy this comment. This does the same thing as that code, but for monthly. So check if our monthly realized equity high minus current realized equity exceeds our stored max down for the month and update if necessary and save worst drawdown. Um, doesn't need to be worst drawdown ever. It's the worst drawdown for that month. All right, so sorry if I lost you there. Uh, all of this code here is identical. It's copy and pasted. This here is tracking the yearly max drawdown and this here is tracking the monthly max drawdown. And then that's it for our closed trade information. We calculate everything we need to know in order to display our performance table. At the very end of our if statement here, we have the debug label. So if I turn this on, these blue labels here that show our PL, our cumulative PL as a percentage, and this tool tip that gives information on what the script is currently doing um, is all done here by this label. So if debug is turned on, we create this giant string where we add up all of these different variables, values, debug information, and then we display a label with this very long string as a tooltip so that we can use a somewhat of a magnifying glass and see what the script is doing on a trade by trade basis. I used these labels to confirm that the performance table was showing accurate information, but this is turned off by default. So unless you run into an issue with the script or you just want to verify that the information is correct. You don't need to turn this on. You don't need to worry about this label. So now moving on, I need to get rid of this test code. Uh, that's not needed. Uh, the next thing we do here is prepare arrays to store our yearly and monthly PLs. So we have two persistent arrays here, VAR arrays. One is storing our monthly returns. One is storing our yearly returns. And the table code at the end of the script will loop through these arrays and display that information as a table. But before we do that, we need to detect when a new month and a new year begins. So new month will be true when the current month's timestamp is not equal to the previous month's timestamp. That means we've begun a new month and same for new year. So now that we have a new month and new year detected, all that is left to do is detect a new month. I need to get rid of this. So we're detecting a new month and storing its return profile. So by profile, I mean it's accumulated p &L for the month, it's drawdown for the month, and it's max favorable excursion for the month and the timestamp of the month, the start of the month. So to do this, I create a new strategy monthly return data type, which remember is this guy here. And this data type takes a profit, a drawdown, a peak equity, and a timestamp value. So, that's what I pass in here. Our accumulated monthly PL for this month, the worst drawdown for this month, and the best equity high for this month as a percentage of our account balance. Then we pass in the timestamp. We push this data type into our monthly returns array and we reset all of the monthly performance metric um, variables to zero. 
So we're starting a new month, everything goes back to zero, and we start the whole process again of calculating our monthly PL, drawdown, equity high, etc. And because we've started a new month, if this month is January, then we have started a new year as well. So within this new month if statement, we also check if we have a new year. And if we have a new year, we do exactly the same thing as we do here. We store this year's, this past year's performance metrics into the yearly returns array. This code is identical to the monthly code, but instead of tracking the monthly PL metrics, it's tracking the yearly PL. So the past 12 months worth of information. And that's it. All that's left to do is to display this onto a table. So here is some more debug code. Uh, if we have debug turned on and we turn these on, um, these two BG color functions will light up when we have a new month or a new year. So red means new year, green means new month. And this just makes it easier for you to dial in, see what happened within a month, a given month. So this is February, 2023. So for this month, February, 2023, we should have in our table a return of 1.32% because we only had one trade in that month and it was a winning trade. We did open a second trade in that month, but that trade did not close until March for a small loss. So this doesn't get counted in the February PL because we didn't know this was going to lose until the next month. So, so this month should show 1.32 in the table. Let's turn the table on. Look for February, 2023, 1.32. So that's why I include this uh, debug code to make it easier to verify that the script is doing what it should be doing. Now let's go over the table code briefly to wrap up this script uh, lesson. I don't think I need to go into too much information about this table. Um, I've got lessons on tables already. It's not exactly rocket science. It's just a lot of copy and pasted code to format the whole thing. So the first thing we do is define our table data type as performance table. And then if this is the last bar on our chart, then we display our performance table. So if the table is turned on in the settings menu, and this is the last confirmed historical bar on our chart, then performance table is created with 100 rows, which equals 100 years of data, which should be plenty for all markets. Um, you can barely fit 30. Um, years worth of data on the chart when your screen is at a normal resolution. But if you're trading a market that has a lot of historical data, I couldn't find a way to only display a certain amount of information. So I tried to write some code that would only show the past 10 years of data or whatever, and I couldn't get it to show accurate metrics down here. It can be done, but it was just so complicated that I just decided against that. I wanted to keep the script simpler and I, to be honest, to be completely honest with you, I'd spent so much time on the script already. I just wanted to be done with it. Uh, maybe I'll revisit it at a later date when I have less coding PTSD for this project. And I can try and add a time based window for this performance table. But instead of doing that, all I did was add um, the monthly and the, the table headers at the top of the table, you can't see them here because they're off my chart. But I added those same table headers to the bottom of the table. So no matter how big this chart gets, you can still see what each column um, is representing. So anyway, we are displaying a lot of data. Um, I don't think there'll be any market you'll find any data source that will have more than 100 years of data on the chart. In fact, I don't think TradingView will even be able to, to display that many bars, at least not daily bars, maybe monthly bars. But anyway, it's not important. We create a giant table. The next thing we do is set our column headers. So we set our column headers by using the cell function. And in fact, we can actually use the new, there's a new method for doing this, uh, like so. We might as well use it. So in the past, we needed to use the table.cell function in order to achieve this. But now we can actually use the cell function directly on the table type, uh, which makes the code just that slightly more efficient, just less characters to achieve the same thing. So the first two numbers in the cell function are the column and the row. So zero is the very first row on our table. And then zero is the first column, one is the second column and so on. So this sets our table headers for each column. Then we cycle through 
the total yearly returns array size with the year index, we get the yearly return for this loop, for this year of the current loop, and we set the year number in the first column and then determine the color of the cell. Uh, we also populate the cell values. So if I turn on my table, well, the table's already on. This for loop is looping through each year one by one. So it will start at the very first year of our backtest data and cycle up to the current year through this for loop. And so the first thing we do is set the year title. So that's this cell here. And then we determine the color of this cell, which is our profit and loss cell for that year. So if the year turned a profit, so our yearly return dot profit, um, remember this is a custom data type we created up here that stores profit, drawdown, peak equity and timestamp. If we turned a profit, then we set Y color, year color to our profit color, which is this setting here. And then here's loss color and break even color. That's what this line of code does. And then we create a tooltip for that year. So the max drawdown for the year and the max favorable excursion. So if you hover your mouse over this end of year return, it will tell you the max favorable return. So you can see here on 2011, we actually had a return of positive 12% at one point, but we ended the year down half a percent. So it's interesting information to know. That means we had a pretty bad uh, turnaround this year. And you can see that here, we lost all of our profit in one month, essentially. And then we use the performance.sell function to set our yearly return profit. We round that number up or down based on our get rounding precision. Remember that's the custom function we created at the very start of the script that forces these numbers into three decimal places if the number is very, very small. So that's how we populate the yearly values. Um, the next thing we do is set our monthly values. We do exactly the same thing. We loop through our monthly returns array. We get what year this month fell within. We get what month number. January would be one, December would be 12. Um, that gives us our column starting here. So January would be one. So the column would be one and then so on all the way to December. And then we get the month row, which is the current year minus the very first year um, that we have on our table here. And that gives us which row we are working with. So we've got our monthly columns and now we've got our row based on the year that this month fell within. And then finally, we have yet another bit of somewhat confusing code here because, and I'll explain this comment here. It says, we need to shift all month cells back one cell. This is because our profit and loss values are added to the array at the start of a new month. So all of our array values are technically off by one month. So there might be a better way to achieve what I've done here that's less hacky. I did try to manipulate the array values themselves, but I honestly couldn't figure out a simple way to do this. And so this seemed like a better solution. Um, and what I mean by all of our values are off by one month is, let's use the latest year as an example. The data for February, the monthly data for February is not known until the 1st of March. And so technically, if we don't shift all of these cells back one, then March, would be showing 1.32 because on the very first trading day of March, we get February's trading data because the month is com confirmed to be over. And it it's much easier to detect a new month than it is to detect the final day of a month. And so what we're doing here is shifting all of these cells back one. Uh, this is pretty easy to do, except for when you're in this cell here, because you need to shift this cell all the way back to here. So December's data for 2022 is not known until the 1st of January, 2023. So we need to shift this value all the way back to this cell. And that's what this uh, code here does. Now I don't need this Boolean value in here. I think that was just for testing purposes. Uh, but basically we are setting our month call to the month call minus one. And if our month column equals zero, so that would be this column here, then we need to shift it back to this column. And uh, so that would be column number 12 or month number 12, December. And we also need to shift the month row back 
um, from this row to this row. So if this cell gets shifted back to this cell, then we need to set the column to 12 to December, and we need to move it back one row to this row. So that's what this code here does. Then we determine the color. So this background color for each cell is determined by this line of code here that just checks if there was a profit. Um, if so, then we set the profit color. Otherwise, uh, if it was break even, we set the break even color and otherwise it must be a loss. So we set it to the loss color. Now you'll notice that these cells are brighter. The backgrounds are brighter than these cells. I found a really easy way to achieve this just using the transparency of whatever this value is. So if I set this to aqua, for example, you'll notice that all these yearly cells are brighter than the monthly cells. So they're easy to differentiate between. I did this really easily by just creating a new color for this end of year um, column and adding 20% transparency to the profit color. So color.t will get the colors transparency and I add 20% transparency. That way we don't need a lot of different color inputs here. We can just keep one input and at one click of the button, the table will keep its uh, color formatting in terms of the end of year columns being brighter than the monthly columns. And then finally, we set the monthly tip tooltip. So that's this, when you hover over, it tells you the max drawdown and max favorable excursion for each month. Uh, depending on the system, these numbers could be very different or almost always the same. On this system, they're almost always the same, but there will be times when uh, we had a nice profit and then lost some of that profit during the month. Uh, because this system doesn't take many trades during a month, there's not too much of a fluctuation between uh, the PL for that month. But here on the 0.002, you can see that at one point we were up 0.57%, but we obviously had a winning trade and a losing trade in that month that brought us back down to basically break even. And then finally, if this is the final array element and we haven't completed the year yet, then we need to fill the current year's PL. So this code here detects if our monthly index, our loop, is equal to the final element in our array and we are not in December, then we still wanna display our accumulated yearly PL for this year and our max drawdown for this year. So that's what this code does. It just forces the table to display this year's PL, end of year PL, even though the year hasn't finished yet. And then finally, we set the yearly table titles last. Um, because we are shifting all these cells uh, back one uh, cell like this, you know, each first month is shifted back to the December cell. At the top of our table, uh, this method can override our table, can override some of our table headings. So at the end of all of this display code, we set the yearly table titles last. Putting this last fixes my shifting of each monthly cell back one cell, which overrides table titles if they're set before the loop above. And then uh, we calculate the performance metrics based on realized P and L. So that is this information here. We have our compound annual growth rate, our max drawdown for the system overall, our MA ratio, which is our compound annual growth rate divided by max drawdown. It gives you an idea of how quickly the system can recover from losing streaks and our total return. And we have tooltips on each value here to explain what each value is. So this is where we calculate those performance metrics. So our percent return is very simple. Um, that's just getting this number here, which is our net profit divided by our initial capital, multiplied by 100 to get a percent. Our compound annual growth rate is a little bit more complicated. You can Google the formula for CAGR if you want to. You don't need to understand how this math works, but this gives our compound annual growth rate. And then we have our MA ratio, which I just said is our uh, CAGO divided by our worst drawdown. Then finally, we populate our performance data, these cells down here, and the tool tips. So we have a, so we have our various tool tips as well. And then at the very end, we set our uh, column headers at the bottom of the table, which is all these values down here. And that's it. That's the end of our performance table code. As I said, you can copy all of this code into your script and it should theoretically work with most scripts. There are going to be some that it might not work with 
depending on the complexity of your system and how many positions it trades, I definitely encourage you to uh, verify that the information on the table is accurate. I can't guarantee that it will be for every system on TradingView, but it should work for most. With that said, the source code will be below in the pinned comment and the video description. If you want to learn more about PineScript and take your coding to the next level, make sure to check out the mastery course. Uh, if you're already experienced at Pine, then you might find my indicators and strategies course more interesting. You can find all of that at pinescriptmastery.com. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, because I will be back very soon with a new video. Thanks for watching. I love you guys, and I will speak with you in the next video. Good luck with your trading and take care.